Welcome to the Writing with Purpose podcast, where I, Anna Wollescroft, chat with fellow writers and outdoor enthusiasts about how we can embrace creativity and curiosity to live a life full of adventure that doesn't feel like hard work. I delve into exploratory conversations about my two loves in life, writing and nature connection, as part of my mission to share the well-being benefits they both bring. It's wonderful to have you here today. On today's Writing With Purpose podcast, I'm chatting with author and financial advisor, Carl Lehman, about money, mind and meaning, and how just being is the way forward. Brilliant. Hey, so Carl, welcome to the podcast. I'm excited to talk to you about um, what it is that you do, the fact that you've written a book and then you've written a second book and how you sort of bring in um, nature and the great outdoors as, as, as a love of what you do, but into your work and, and sort of all of your ethics and things. So uh, welcome along. Thank you. Uh, first of all, um, you've you've been in the financial industry for almost 40 years. So congratulations. And <laughs> we've known each other probably for, I don't know, over a decade? Yep. Yeah, um, for sure. And you, you are not the typical financial advisor that you know a lot of people I think think of it people that live in that industry uh, sorry work in that industry so um yeah do you want to tell us a little bit about sort of your journey to date in a in a kind of nutshell and um, yeah so um actually fi- the, the the financial services profession uh, I don't use the word industry by the way because we don't actually manufacture anything so I rename it profession but okay. uh, that's just me being uh picky on that one yeah. so um an when- example of use of language as well though isn't it yeah it is you interpret it and others interpret it yeah do you know what? Most people still refer to it as an industry, but you know when you've you've got chartered and certified tucked under your belt, um, uh, <laughs> call it a profession. So um, my my career was going to be in the Royal Air Force. Would you believe that? And so um, I don't really know this, but I, I was an air cadet in my teenage years. Wow. And uh, I was planning on sort of going into the RAF. Um, and you know what it's like. Your parents go to uh, parents' evening at school. My father came home and said, Carl. I've spoken to your commerce teacher and I've spoken to your accounts teacher and you're, you know, you're top of the class. You're, you're not going in the RAF sunshine. Well, I said, well, I am dad. And he said, well, no, you're not. But he dragged me kicking and screaming out of school at the age of 16 um, on the basis that I did an apprenticeship with him for a couple of years. And if I didn't like it, you know, I, I could then sort of reapply and sort of go in the RAF. But here we are. 38 years down the line. Yeah, it's still there. <laughs> I've stood the distance. So, yeah, I, I worked with dad um, from the age of 16. Sadly, he passed away very suddenly uh, just after my 20th birthday, which taught me a lot about business um, and, you know, all the, all the problems that can arise if you don't have a will or, you know, legal documents that aren't, um, you know, validated properly. Um, and I kind of picked up the baton, run with it. And then 20 years ago, I formed my own practice, Layman Financial Management, um, and uh, we're, we're a small team. And um, yeah, I'm a chartered wealth manager and published author on the subject now. Mm. So I give you a little precy of the, the history. It does. It does. I mean, yeah, you, you were sort of thrust into that from a very early age, 16. And then, of course, what happened with your dad. And then you sort of had to learn the ropes in other areas very, very quickly. But, you know, that, that kind of natural um, tendency to understand the figures and be drawn into that is it was was beneficial. But also as well, I think, you know, you you mentioned that, that you know, the published author there in the first book that you created you know there's, there's probably was there an element of that that was kind of bubbling away from you from an early age because of what happened to you do you think because um you know the, the sort of dream it plan it live it you you've got to have that aspiration haven't you in, in in sort of your vision and your dreams and then you know you do need some tangible actions and things to put into place in order to get there I think it grew, to be honest with you. Like I said, dad passed away when I was 20. So there was uh, there's probably a period of about 9, 10, 11 months where I was in the wilderness, not really knowing where I was going to be next. Um, I did 
end up then working with what was his ex senior partner. Um, and he was a great mentor, really great guy, actually. Um, and then, then I found somebody else and worked with them and they were very psychologically um, aware. And I can remember, I, I don't know, I must have been 21, 22, uh, going on a Brian Tracy psychology of achievement. Oh, yeah. And that completely opened my mind to the the possibilities that actually, you know, th- this this space here in, in our minds, in our heads, is, is, is the thing that really drives us forward. So I think I became very psychologically aware uh, at that age. Um, and then I think I probably had about eight years working as most financial advisors or as I tend to call them financial advertisers do which is simply flogging products and you know (laughs) that I I got to the age of maybe 30 31 something along those lines and and that's where the idea of the dream it planet live it philosophy was born here we go there's the uh, said book Um, (laughs) (laughs) and um, I'll probably be I don't know, 34, 35, uh, my wife, Sarah, is a doctor in clinical psychology. And I was talking to her about actually quitting the financial services business. Um, and she goes, why? And I said, do you know what? I said, I'm fed up of doing the same old thing that other financial advisors do. You've got, you've got these big companies that manufacture products. They then go to the independent financial advice community, the IFA community, and say, hey, here's the latest, new, shiniest product. Go and sell that to your client. And that's what I did. And that's what most financial advisors, or as I say, financial advertisers do. And I was really despondent because it was just not really getting to the issue, the nub of the issue with people. Um, so Sarah said, look, I'll do some coaching with you. I'll, I'll kind of you know work with your mind and see what's really, really important to you. So out of that came my core values, which was I I really wanted to make an impact on people's lives broader than just a few quid in your pension scheme or a few quid in in your ISA. Um, And and actually, I'd I'd done a coaching uh, qualification and, and my wife, Sarah, said to me, look, you know, I think you're really good at what you do. Can you not change the model? of what financial planning looks like, what proper financial life planning looks like. And I like a challenge. Um, so out of that really was born the Dream It, Planet, Live It book um, yeah. and the way in which we work. Um, so that's that's where that was all born from. It sounds as though you wanted something that was was kind of, you could get your teeth into something that was a little bit more creativity, uh, yeah. something a little bit more creative. And that, that's something that I think helps to fuel us a, a lot of yeah. times. You know, if we if we feel bored or fed up of, of something that we're doing, whether it be a career or whether it just be something that we do in our personal life, I actually think that it's because we're, we're lacking creativity and there's yeah. something that's not sort of pulling the potential from within us out there. So it sounds as though what you the work that you did with Sarah, with your wife, kind of opened up the fact that here's a way for you to to sort of be a bit more creative. You've got this idea in your head that, you know, things weren't actually being talked about or dealt with in, 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 yeah. in a full holistic way. And then the book was a solution for people that say, hey, there's actually a lot of other things to think about and here's a much better way to approach and implement, you know, your your financial stability and achieve what you want. Yeah. Absolutely, because money is just an energy. It allows you mm. allows you to do good, do good stuff or do bad stuff, depending on how you're wired. Mm. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it's then attaching. What does that money then give you? What well, what's the attachments of that? What does it sort of actually sort of provide for you? Um, so yeah, that that that's a little bit more outside the box, as you say, a bit more creative. Yeah, 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 and and you know, again, I think a lot of people, myself included we approach financial things and we think, well, I'm not really a numbers person. I don't quite mm. want that. But your your formula, if you like, and, and your book in particular, it makes it really simple for people just to pick up, grab a cup of tea, start reading, and yes. actually, I can do this. This this actually is a relatively yeah. simple process, albeit you've got to look at a few different, you know, aspects of life. But yep. it, makes it, it makes it achievable for yeah. people. Yeah, I, um, I think that's really important because mm. – so many people look at the numbers and think, wow, I, I could never be financially free. I could never do this. I could never do that. I could never do the other. And actually, you can. You just need to do a few things consistently well. And that's where the yeah. book comes in in terms of helping people get their head around those sorts of things. Yeah, thinking about what they need to do at a certain age maybe or yep. 
different lifestyle choices as well that sure. you, know, you can sacrifice a little bit now to actually improve everything a little bit later on in life yeah. and yeah I don't know about you and and sort of um your clients as well I think you reach a certain age in life and you think actually there must be a bit more Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think we become, you know, pro well, probably what you just you said earlier about Brian Tracy. I mean, he's one of the the sort of forerunners, isn't he, with this mm -hmm. psychological uh, behavior and understanding yourself from a mindset point of view. Yeah. And I think you reach a certain age and you do start questioning, well, what you know, what is my purpose? What is life all about? Mm -hmm. Have these big questions that you you actually don't consider in your twenties, albeit you perhaps did do because of. Mm -hmm. You know, your yes. experience and, and with your dad and yes. um, a lot of people just think you know not going to happen to me uh i've got plenty of time to think about this and, yeah. and really that's it's approaching it from the wrong angle completely isn't it yeah, yeah um, absolutely so, so yeah it's fascinating so um yeah so you you're, you're a published author have you always had that that kind of um interest in writing sort of you know have you have you ever journaled or you know do you read a lot what's what's kind of your earliest memories of, of sort of writing and reading and, and, and kind of sharing information you know mm. sort of I, I think where I got really engaged with the power of words was uh this will harken back to um secondary school days really I had a an amazing English teacher so uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the film Dead Poet Society with Robin Williams Ah, uh, a long, long time ago. Yeah, a long, long time ago. So well, he, he, he was an out of the ordinary type teacher. And, and, and so indeed was um, Tony Murray, who was um, deputy headmaster of the school I went to, um, but but English teacher. And I can remember um, doing back in those days, O-levels, so that dates me. Um, but, <laughs> you, you know, other, other, other classes would have folder upon folder upon folder of notes. And, and just before the um, exams, you know, people would say, well, how many folders have you got? And we had one, mm. had one folder. And um, there was just, you know, literally half, half A4 sort of pages in there because he worked on the philosophy that you had to think yeah. and, and it was your thinking that then governed how you wrote, how you reasoned an argument, how creative you were. But the one thing that ignited me with uh, Of Mice and Men was a book that we did as part of li English literature. Um, but he used to encourage all the students in, in his class to sort of use voices. And I can remember him getting up and, you know, he was a, big burly rugby playing kind of a guy and he used to go Lenny you crazy bastard and you know I used to think my goodness me this school teacher is swearing in the classroom what the hell is going on here um, but I guess he kind of um, aroused that kind of curiosity in the power of words um, I have journaled yes um, I do it now more than ever actually most most days I will journal um, get stuff out your head is really valuable um but I think because essentially as a financial life planner, we're in the communication business, really, first and foremost, we need to understand with crystal clear clarity exactly who we're dealing with, what's important to them, what keeps them awake at night. So it's that communication type type thing. So that, I think that's where the wordplay comes comes from, really, is but... I don't know, that, that original interest came from Tony Murray, who's no longer with us. Uh, but it's, it's funny how these people plant a legacy in your life, isn't it, really? Yeah, it is. And for, for positive or negative outcomes with some people. But, yeah, I like what you were saying there about him encouraging to sort of, you know, think. And a lot of it comes from from the mind. And I, I think, you know, part of that is just free flow writing and you have yeah. an idea or you've got something that you need to discuss. And then you just sort of igniting your inner creativity almost your own storyteller really to, to start mm. writing and then it does it just flows and um I think for me being um a writer sort of for businesses but also trying to do more now from a creativity standpoint is that you know it just helps to to sort of get an idea and just flow with it mm. without your logical rational mind stepping mm -hmm. in and saying you can't write that or that's not right mm. and I know there's certain boundaries that you know you you need to keep in from within from a professional point of view um but the way you were describing that then as being in the communication business sure 
just it's, it's sort of sales and marketing and, and, yeah. and all the kind of aspect where we need to understand who it is that we're talking to and yeah. their wants and needs and what their life looks like and then you've got a picture of of how they operate and where they want to be almost and then you just sort of fill in a few of the gaps so, yeah you know here's how you can get there yeah i think uh, also adding on to that now i mean something that's really sort of topical is is ai and you know the, yeah. the sort of impact it might have on you know each of our businesses but i think at the end of the day in this world now as arguably we're more connected than ever before i don't know about you anna but i feel like we're more disconnected than ever before mm -hmm. because actually in this virtual world i think people crave that kind of actual connection and and something that ai is not going to do i don't think yet um is, is is kind of mirror my tone or mirror your tone and and people either get you or they don't in which case Either way, that's fine. Yeah. But it, it, it's that kind of human contact and, you know, post-COVID, I think now in, in this world that we're living in, people probably want that now more than ever. Mm. What's your sense on that? Yeah, I completely agree. And certainly, you know, when we got used to having to have these meetings and seeing people virtually, yeah. it has created a bit of a void that mm. the human, the face-to-face -face interaction actually provides. And certainly now I'm getting out and about and I'm seeing more people face-to-face -face again. I think there's always going to be a place for online because it offers convenience and accessibility for people. And some people prefer that, but other people don't, you know, they haven't got any other way to access things. Mm. But I think if you can, you know, everything is so much more enriching when you are with somebody face to face yeah um, and you know you can see more body language you can hear the tone better you know you can see sort of the emotional element coming in and, and yeah I, I don't think ai will i'm hesitant and i think you were a bit hesitant as well because you know at some point probably there will be a lot more of that tone and personal emotion because you know ai learns doesn't mm. it so but at the moment um yeah i mean i i've tested a few things and it's quite rigid Mm -hmm. I would say in what you get back um, and, you know, there's a lot of fluff involved mm -hmm. in what you get back, you know, there's, there's not sort of the same clarity that you would have from knowing your profession inside and out and your clients inside and out. And and I think, you know, it's got a place for helping processes and things to be, become maybe quicker or more effective, but sure. not for the, I was having this conversation with someone the other day, just generally about writing and how, writing makes you feel in the same way that drawing or painting or dancing makes you feel as a person um and you know ai is not ever going to replace that on the individual level mm. um so yeah it's a big topic at the moment isn't it big oh, it's, it's huge um there's a mastermind group that i i attend and actually there's a the guy there who runs uh, an ifa practice and he was saying that actually um, he believes his business will be dead in 10 years' time, and it, which, which really? was quite surprising, really, because I grinned at my eldest son, Harry, who's in the practice with me, mm -hmm. and I thought, actually, it probably will be for him because he has a particular formula, um, and it's very one size that fits all and sheep dips everybody through the process yeah. uh, whereas we, we, we spend a lot of time up front doing the human element because at the end of the day, unless we know what the money's for, Mm -hmm. and, and then you can't really dispense proper financial planning um, unless you really, really dig deep into, you know, what keeps people awake at night, what their hopes are, yeah. what their dreams are. So I, I think for us, until such time as you can replicate a human being, we're still in business. <laughs> Perhaps we'll just offer people alternative choices. Mm. If they want some sort of financial advice, then he is kind of the automated route, a little bit like comparison websites, mm. maybe. And, you know, they'll put in a few bits of information and they'll churn something out at the other side or maybe work something else out. Um, but it, it's never going to have that almost backwards and forwards and life experience that, mm. you know, certainly you've got from working with people for 38 odd years. You know, I mean, that's that's that can't be learned unless you do that for that. Yeah amount of time surely time will tell <laughs> time will tell exactly so let's talk a little bit about your latest book carl and you yeah. wrote one hey do you, do you um, want a visual prompt for that there we go we got visual that prompt. there we go which is in hardback <laughs> this time good to see so what <clears throat> you know what led you to to to, to write the 
second book because you've got some case studies and things in there haven't you and you know did you do was it something that you came across that you thought actually there's more information that i need to share here there's something that that is you know missing what 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 led you to uh to, to write the second one so two or three things really um i think dream it planet live it is a, is a cracking little book for uh people who who don't really have an idea of how to get their financial ducks lined up in a row, you know, how much money they need in their freedom fund, which is a pot of money that allows you to make work optional at some point. And it's a great book to walk you through that step-by-step process of helping you to dream, plan, and ultimately live the exact life that you want without worrying about money. I think where where the second book came from was we we have a number of um, business owner clients who are retired and they say, well, this is great, Carl. You've got this book written telling us how to accumulate our freedom fund, but actually we have accumulated our freedom fund. So so now what? So Mm -hmm. I interviewed a lot of these people and it was really understanding from their perspective, they've got all the money that they need to be able to live the lifestyle that they want. But actually, what was their meaning? What were their drivers? Because you can imagine if you've been at the helm of your own business for you know, 20, 30, 40 years, and then you're, you're kind of cruising to retirement, you think it's like sitting on the beach, sipping pina coladas, having a great time. For a lot of people, it then brings into all sorts of things about their identity and who they really are. Um, and, and as my role evolves, actually, within Dream It, Planet, Live It, my, my oldest son, Harry, is taking on more and more of the client work, and I'm more and more business development focused. And I can tell you, you know, from personal experience, it, it throws up some questions in your mind. You think, hang on a minute, I used to be doing this, but now I don't do that anymore. So it's more like a chairperson role uh, that I'm doing. So I think there was a trigger there from certainly our retired clients who are saying, this is great that you've got this book, but what about me? What about what about me in retirement? Then COVID hit. And I think when COVID, um, obviously my wife works in the NHS and you know, we're surrounded by people within the NHS, it kind of made me really do a lot of research into where um that kind of meaning, where happiness really comes from. Because a lot of people think do you know what, if I've got two million pounds or one million pounds or five million pounds, whatever the figure might be in my freedom fund, I'll be happy. Yeah. Or will you? Yeah. Money will you really? Yeah. Um, and so I did all sorts of research into where, you know, happiness comes from. Um, I talked to all sorts of research. I I'd, I'd worked on a coaching program uh, with some of the best international coaches in the world during sort of uh, 2020. Um, and that opened my mind into kind of the power of coaching and morning routines, afternoon routines, and just really leveraging uh, what, what what you do with your life you know we've all got a certain amount of hours minutes and days on this planet earth what impact can we make so the book was deliberately um entitled money mind meaning which actually uh, the title was um created by my, my son jacob because he, he's really creative and go right this is what i'm thinking did 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 um, yeah. We had the word money in there and I had the word mind. He said, well, money, mind, meaning. So ultimately, at the end of the day, like I said earlier, m- money is just an energy. It allows you to do stuff. But this is about how with small changes, you can make big differences, not only in your financial plan, but also in your life plan. Um, because it's one of those things, I think, um, a lot of people live quiet lives of desperate you know, the quiet lives of desperation. They they have all of these things going on in their head, but unless you calm the mind and actually stop and reflect and think what's really important to me, and that's where spending time in the great outdoors, Anna, is really important because when you connect with nature in that regard, it helps you to kind of just give your brain the, the space it needs to work out. Otherwise, we all get sucked into this vortex, don't we, of just doing it, doing it, doing it. This is what successful people do, da 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 but actually if you just unless you go stop what am i here for what are the key things i need to be doing with my life what's going to give me the greatest happiness and that's what that book is all about and it's got some of the greatest and latest science uh in that book um and for me it's yeah i i'm dead proud of that i think it's a, a great piece of work um and was flabbergasted again that november last year got number one 
uh, on Amazon in the UK and the United States, which is just brilliant, really. So, yeah, chuffed to bits. Yeah, and congratulations. Yeah, thank you. You know, touching on that that topic of happiness, it is it's an it's a growing industry, isn't it? Happiness. I was talking to someone a while ago, and she was saying that you know that's that's kind of like the category now for books. Yes. That self development, personal develop. Now it's all about happiness, and I think just understanding yourself a little bit more and where some of these motivations come from. Um, and you know, to say that money is an energy might be a little bit, you know, hard for some people to to grasp. But mm. you know, we as human beings are our energy, aren't we? Everything yeah, yeah. is, is made yep. of energy. And I think if we've got negative energy towards money, then things aren't going to happen in the way that we hope they are. Um, sure. And I think Personally, I was a bit concerned about money at the end of last year, start of this year, because I was I was sort of I was kind of trans transitioning my business, shall we say, and, and yeah. I had a big issue with money at the time. Um, but as soon as I got over that, everything just organically seemed to start coming back to me and, you know, making money and, you know, the opportunities, shall we say, just I don't know, energetically must have just been aligned and <laughs> you know, work, worked out for, for for the better for me. But yeah, I think it's important for people to sort of be able to read something like that and, and sort of also you know, read that people have gone through this before and the fact that you've got it packed with research and that you know people can say, okay, well, other people have been through this before me and it's not new and it helps yeah. them just to you know get on board with it a little bit more, shall we say. Um, are there any plans for a third book? Um, I, I, th- th- there should be a trilogy, shouldn't there? there uh, absolutely yeah. should be a trilogy. <laughs> um, I, I, I think, truth be told, I'll leave the third book for Harry to write. Um, so um, he wrote the forward in the second book. Um, and I think it's quite right that we have a more modern uh, approach to kind of what we do um so you know ha- harry's late 20s um been around in the business now for for, for 10 years um wow. and he's obviously grown up with all of this stuff being a dinner table conversation yeah. um so he has a a take on what we do as a as a family practice but i think i think the third book in that subject should be his um i've actually got a manuscript of a book that my father uh, authored um nice. and it, it it's only part complete because when he died I, I don't know some parts went sort of disappearing and it's uh it's actually a novel so uh, when i cruise into retirement anna the third book that i'll probably write will be actually taking his manuscript reworking it and um uh, some of his model on people who uh, I actually remember sort of kind of growing up with. So there's a bit of detective work that I need to do there as well. So yeah. it was something completely different, I suspect. Yeah, creative nonfiction, as they call it. Now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that sounds fascinating. I shall look forward to that. Yeah, it's going to be an Just easy Just before we wrap up, Carl, then, sure. um, you mentioned about the, the great outdoors and, you know, that's something that, it, yeah, I totally agree with you that it's very expansive and I think it helps with clarity, which also helps to develop your ideas and it helps to give you a little bit more uh, kind of grounding and purpose in life. And you love the great outdoors as well, don't you? You you walk quite a lot, you cycle, you now live near the ocean so you can yeah. see you know, the English Channel, is it, every time? It's literally out my window here, yeah. Yeah. Um, so just tell me a little bit about, um, you know, how you, you kind of, what, what sort of, what the Great Outdoors means to you and, and how you, you kind of use that in, in your life. Uh, well, as you said that, what does the great outdoors mean to you? I actually felt my spirit rise in my body. Mm-hmm. You know, it's an interesting thing. I was just imagining myself walking down uh, a particular pathway um, uh, on the Mamhead Trail, which is kind of between here and Exeter, um, and it's just glorious. So for me, it's it, it's a place where I can just get peace and I can get some solitude, and it just feels good to be outdoors and I don't know I mean we've got a, a balmy cocker spaniel who's two years old so you know sometimes I'll take him off for a walk and you think oh gosh you know I've got all this ruminating around in my head and I don't really know where the way is forward in terms of this task that I'm trying to work through um, and I talk to people about the path of flow and the path of force but for me when I'm out in in nature whether it be on on my mountain bike or you know walking the dog 
the path of flow just generally seems to just, I don't know, just channels things much more easily in my head. I, I guess it's a combination is it A, you're getting a bit of exercise. So you think more creatively when you've had exercise, you're calmer. You've got all those good endorphins buzzing around in your bloodstream. Um, be outdoors, you, you, it then triggers all sorts of other things in your brain, doesn't it? So you, you just have greater clarity of thinking. So I, I think for me, it's a place that I go for uh, respite. It's a place that in the morning, I'll, it's part of my morning rise and shine routine. You know, we'll take the dog for a walk on the beach and there's no finer way to start that, whatever the weather. Um, and, and it's a place that sometimes if I just want to think, I will literally take myself off with a pad and pen and just, you know, sit under a tree, you know, hope an apple doesn't fall on my head or something. <laughs> um, <laughs> but just, I think if you get out of your normal environment, whatever that is, and, you know, sit by water or sit with greenery around you, you just get greater clarity of thinking, whether that be thinking about work, thinking about your relationships, thinking about whatever. Yeah. Um, and sometimes it's just nice just to, just to be, did you understand what I mean by that? Just not actually yeah. have an agenda, just sit yeah. there and be and see what rises to the surface. It all sounds yeah. a bit woo-woo, which down in Devon is quite, quite normal, quite really. Normal. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they've got so much beauty down there, haven't they? As far oh, as glorious. Like, you know, the coast, but you, yeah, just to be able to sort of sit there or stand there. And I think you do, yeah. And just sort of be at one with nature mm -hmm. and, um, you, you kind of don't need anything else at that time. It's just you know, being completely aware of your sort of being present, isn't it? And, and aware of your surroundings. And I think that just somehow helps with the clarity and the creativity or whatever it is that you're looking for. Mm. You mentioned walking out there with a notepad and pen and just having that intention of, okay, I'm going to get outside. I'm going to give myself a little bit of space and I'm just going to see what flows. Mm. And I think, yeah, you're right with that sort of path of, of flow um, that you referred to that if you're moving a little bit, then it starts to get things flowing a little bit more. But, but equally, if you're just sitting there and you're outside, it is that change of scenery and it's becoming, I think I find that if I can become sort of more aware of the the, the kind of elements around me from a sensory, mm -hmm. okay? again, I'm probably sounding a bit woo-woo now, but you know, you smell certain things, you hear things like the bird song or the rustling of the trees or the flow of the, the water crashing of the waves, you know, whatever that is, it, I think it just helps to kind of boost things. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you, you get a positive outcome of that, whether you're looking to write something down, work through a problem, it just comes. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's one of those things that we, we have more and more devices, don't we, in our lives now, whether it be, yeah. you know, this screen I'm looking at now, or, you know, your, your, your phone or your iPad or whatever it may be, you've got lots of things calling for your attention. And sometimes I think you, you, you just need less, less is more. Mm. actually get outside and and turn those things off um i mean i had an incident a couple of months ago where i couldn't fathom the way forward in terms of a particular task and i i had all the coaching questions i got the qualifications and i was sitting there and i was writing it all down i and i couldn't really find the answer and one coach um who you and i both know actually dave you know he said to me you do know the answers you just need to give your brain the time and the space to think and he said go and sit on the seawall where you live and dangle your legs over the seawall with a pad and pen and just see what happens. Just do it every day for 10 minutes. I, I don't know. I must have got to day three and then I like, started writing and I couldn't stop. You know, <laughs> it's just almost like yeah. when you give yourself that space and time, yeah. you go, bang, there it is. There's the answer. Yeah. And it's it's something that we don't have much of in the modern life, do we? That's that space and that time. And I think because of everything that's trying to get our attention, we we don't give it the time that it often needs. Therefore, it never comes. Yeah, so, yeah. Just just creating that space in a way that works for people, and and that might be you know I don't know doing yoga or yeah you know, yeah sitting on a bike. It doesn't necessarily have to be something kind of relaxing and tranquil, does it? It could be something that's a bit more energy boosting. I mean, I do a lot of trail running. For yeah. me, that 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 helps again with the energetic sort of flow and the ideas and that, but not in the same way because normally I'm with people. Um, but yeah, I've got a vision of you there now, Carl, dangling your legs in the sea. <laughs> <laughs> with my hair no buzzing, listening listening to some music or or, or whatever, because music is another great creative outlet, actually. Mm. 
if you play an instrument or, or listen to music, that's another great one. But combine that with the outdoors and you get a double whammy. Do most definitely. Most definitely. <laughs> I quite often bring the music inside as well. I love some yeah. of the, you know, um water flowing or the rain pouring. That's that's very relaxing for me. Even wind turbines, strangely enough, the turning of wind turbines. I've got a podcast that I listen to and that's one of their episodes. And really? it sounds a bit random, but it is actually quite relaxing. Yeah, I guess there's a pattern to it, isn't there? There's a, a reassuring yeah. pattern to it, yeah. That's probably what it is. And I was reading something the other day about the, the vagus nerve, is it? Yeah. That runs through your body and apparently stimulating that vagus nerve helps a lot of things from a, yeah. from a health point of view. And humming is something that helps with it. So it, it turning is a little bit like maybe humming. Mm. And then you can sort of pick up on that, I guess. <laughs> Absolutely. Lots, yeah, of, well. lots of ideas there. Um, so if, I, if, if anyone sort of... Um, wants to get hold of you, Carl, wants to read the book, you know, give you a call as far as getting some advice is concerned, how, how can people reach you? I, I guess the easiest way is just to hit the website. So it's the dreamitplanetlibitbook.com, dreamitplanetlibitbook.com, all sorts of free information on there, plus our contact details or, or connect with us on, on social media. Brilliant. Well, we'll include links to, to all of those in the show notes as well so that people can find you. And is there anything else that you would like to say to anyone listening or watching before we wrap up? Um, I guess one of the little mantras I, that I have is really, you know, the mind is a great thing. Um, and I think we all just need to sort of trust ourselves in that regard a little bit. So um, I always say to people, it, it's our attitude, not our aptitude that determines our altitude. Great. I like that. I might, can I use that? At some you point? can use that one. Think it through. Makes sense. It's our <laughs> attitude, not our aptitude that determines our altitude. It, makes, it does. It makes a lot of sense. And that that's just reminded me of, of, of my adventure climbing Mount Kilimanjaro in January. Yeah, so yeah. A lot of that was about, you know, my attitude towards it, not necessarily, you know, my fitness skill and my, yeah. my ability and sort of walking or hiking um you know the body will keep going a lot longer before the mind does yeah. but i had to practice a lot of stuff there i should have i should have thought about that yesterday on dartmoor my my, my youngest son was dragging us up a tour in dartmoor uh, <laughs> having done the 10 tours walk earlier this year and uh, there he was and i was like i've had enough let's let's go <laughs> home now Let's go and grab a beer somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's your that's your celebration at the end of it. Yeah, that? absolutely. Yeah, yeah. got to earn it first. <laughs> <laughs> it's been wonderful to talk to you, Carl. Thank you very, very much for your time. Thanks for having me, Anna. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you for listening to today's Writing with Purpose podcast. Having conversations with fellow writers or adventure enthusiasts brings two of my biggest loves in life together writing and nature connection. I've been a copywriter and content creator for 23 years, but my passion is writing for wellbeing, and I'm on a mission to share the benefits that putting pen to paper has for personal wellness with as many people as possible. If you want to learn more about writing for your wellbeing and journaling techniques, please connect with me in my Facebook group, Journaling with Anna.